morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, Heidi, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining. Of course. Rob on as well. Hey, Rob. Hey, how's it going, Anthony? Well, thanks for being a part of this. I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. It's a nice change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. <laughs> Let's see. We've got about 56 people on so far. More people join us. So we'll give everyone just a, a few more minutes. We'll wait for uh, Chandar to join as well. Hey, Anthony. Yeah. It was Chandar's birthday yesterday. So you can do something with that. <laughs> Ooh, put me on the spot. Can, can 71 people unmute at the same time and say happy <laughs> birthday, Chandar? <laughs> Let's see. Might be difficult. I, I don't know if anyone watched like the Hamilton, like some good news where they performed that song all on Zoom. I think it's impossible because we tried to say happy birthday all at the same time for like five of us and then we blew it. So I don't, there's some post-production work happening there, I'm, I'm sure. Um, you know, why don't we go ahead and, and get started? I do remember Chandar saying that he had a call right before this, and so there's a chance it went, it went over, but we'll have him join here in a second. Um, but thank you everyone for, for being a part of this and for joining. I'm, I'm super, super excited for, for today. Um, we've got Heidi from Telium here and Rob from DocuSign um, and Chandar will be joining us from Coupa um, in, in a minute here. Um, and so for those of you that have been part of this uh, for the last several weeks, uh, the, the, you probably heard the spiel by now, but, so, but I'll give it one last time. Um, th this idea came, I think almost two months ago now when we were starting, to, we were staring at the uncertainty that was unfolding before us. And as marketers, as, as leaders, we, um, we had to make some decisions on, you know, what do we, what do, you know, how do we see the Q2 forecast shaping out? You know, what is the implication on budget? All of these kind of big decisions that um, we had to make. And I felt very fortunate that I can turn to other marketers and ask them, hey, how, how are you all seeing this? Like, what are some things um, that, that, that changes that you're making? Um, and so that's where this idea kind of came from, you know, what would it look like if we just all got together once a week and just had this type of discussion. Um, and so, uh, that's kind of what the concept is for, for CMO office hours, unscripted, un not very formal. Um, as you can tell with all of us in a zoom, not locked behind a, a go to webinar or whatever, whatever it is. Um, so that, that's kind of the idea for this. And I think over the last several weeks, um, it's been crazy. A lot of good, I think relationships have been formed kind of through this, a lot of, um, great takeaways. I've implemented a lot of things that I've learned from, from you all. So um, that's kind of the spirit of what we're trying to do. Um, really quickly on housekeeping before we dive in, it is super uh, informal. And so, um, you know, if, if you want to mute, unmute and ask a question, that's, that's great. Um, in general, I think just to keep things streamlined, the best way to um, engage is through Slido, um, which I'll go ahead and, and, and drop the link back into the chat here so everyone has it, but it's also in the calendar invite. But effectively, this is a chance for you to um, ask questions of the panelists. We'll keep the, the session kind of moving along um, and we'll be able to um, get to as many of them as we can um, a bit more efficiently. And so slide of the links in your chat. Um, and then this is being recorded and so we'll be able to share this out with everyone afterwards. Um, and then finally, one, one more plug. Um, you know, one of the cool things that happened is there's actually like a, a mini community starting to form around this, which I think is awesome. And, and thanks to folks that have kind of taken on like grassroots kind of initiatives to, to kind of build and expand this. Um, so one person, Adam uh, Dagian, hopefully I said that right, Adam, um, formed a, a group just like this for practitioners. And so the, the topics that we'll cover today are really around like marketing leadership and how are we kind of making decisions. Thanks, Adam. Um, this is meant to be a place for other folks that are sort of on the ground, executing, building programs, how can we go and, and, um, and hit our targets and do the things that our, our companies are asking us to do this quarter or this year. Um, and so Adam, uh, if you don't mind dropping the, the link to that in the chat, folks that are on the practitioner side can, can uh, join the community that you're forming as well. So with that, um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, and before we jump into Slido and some of the questions, we'll just ask, 
um, how, how are you doing? Uh, personally, uh, professionally, how's the company? Um, just maybe a quick just temperature check on uh, how, how you're doing. So I don't know, Heidi, if you want to kick us off. Sure. I think uh, for me personally, I, I always try to look at any sort of challenge or diverse situation as a way to actually get better um, and actually use it as a way to be inspirational with the team. Because honestly, what other choice do you have? Um, I think I, for those of you who know me, I have twin girls at home. Um, so super easy there. I have like no attitude being thrown my way. So like, I think that just being at home all the time with teenage kids is, is fascinating to say the least. But I, again, like, I just really try to see, look, like all of us here on this call, we all have jobs, we're employed. I just, I really try to focus on the good and, and use it as a chance with the team to say, hey, like there isn't anyone in the world that isn't dealing with this like situation right now. So let's use it. Um, and what can we do a little different and try to be inspirational? Um, and then that's not to say I don't have moments where I'm like, yeah, you know, I kind of would like to go out to eat. I'm over doing dishes five times a day. Um, that's the truth. But in general, I, I think it's my personality. I just really try to find what can we get out of this and how can we move things in a positive direction? Yeah, that's great. Rob, any, any thoughts? How are you doing? Oh, well, uh, Heidi, that was motivational. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't know that this was uh, informal because I shaved today <laughs> <laughs> for the first Great. time in, in like a week. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is a crazy time, but I, I guess you know, for me, it just goes, you, you, you anchor back to the, the basics. Um, the same things that are important fundamentally to you at any time are important now. Um, you know, remembering what your priorities are, not just in work, but in life. Um, being a good communicator. Um, again, not just to your customers, but to your team and to your friends and family. Um, and being, at least for me, I think being optimistic about what the future holds. So I guess, you know, to answer your question, how am I doing? I feel like I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> um, and it's because I think I'm, I'm anchored on those, those three things. That's great. The one thing I've noticed too is like there's certainly, there's ebbs and flows for sure. Um, one um, optimistic, positive kind of thing that I'm reflecting on is, uh, the dis disruption to routine uh, was kind of something that was very disruptive, obviously, uh, early on in this. But I'm personally starting to get in the rhythm of working completely remotely with the team. And I think we're establishing our cultural norms that have now evolved and, and become, you know, obviously a little bit different. And so this week felt a little bit more like getting back into the rhythm of this new normal versus something that's like so radically, radically different. Um, hey, actually, this is Chandar. I'm on the call. Just in hey, case Chandar. Hi, hi, hi. Happy hey, birthday. Chandra. Happy belated. Happy belated birthday. <laughs> thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you again. So, Chandra, tell us how, how are, uh, we're just doing a quick check in before we get started. Like, how are you doing personally? And then just in general, outlook from, from the business, um, just given kind of the sort of craziness kind of surrounding us today. Yeah, it's a good question. And then Heidi's answer was great. I think, you know, I think marketers, we tend to be optimists. And you know, personally, it's it's about you know how does how can adversity have a seed of benefit in it? And the seed of benefit for us personally is that you know I get to spend more time with the family, with the kids, and uh, one teenage daughter, not two teenage two teenage kids like Heidi. It's always an interesting uh, experience, but I don't really get family bonding and time, and that's been one personal benefit out of this. And I really get some quality time with the family, whether it's in the walks or having discussion of topics, etc. And then professionally, the word I would use is agility, right? And I think at this time for us is, you know, as a marketing organization, how agile can we be uh, in terms of shifting across the board, whether it's our positioning or our programs or our parlance or even how we engage with empathy with our customers, mm -hmm. because what worked six weeks ago doesn't work today. And so having that agility and trying to move as fast as possible has been kind of the word of the day for us. And do it and try to do it as thoughtful as possible. So be it at the intersection of thoughtfulness and hustle. That's kind of how we try to operate. Um, not necessarily there every time, but at least try to be in that mindset professionally as we go forward in this in this crazy times. That's great. 
Well, let, let's turn to the questions. Let's just dive in. Um, and as we kind of start going through this, um, I appreciate we have some, some public company CMOs uh, with us today. So I think that the framing for some of this can, can also be, hey, if, if you're advising a startup or a small business that's kind of navigating through these, these kind of challenges, how would you think about some of these, some of these approaches? Um, and so the first one is a question around demand gen um, or just in general, um, how, how can we think about either this notion of experimentation from the different kind of channels that we're running, the different programs um, that we're running. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned agility, uh, Chandar, versus just like sticking to what's already worked in the past, which may not be the case anymore. Um, so I could, as you, as you folks are maybe digesting this, I can give a take. Um, for us, we found that this is a, um, and, and, and those have been on the call for a while know this now, but this is a chance for us to really dive deep from a content perspective and build our um, organic strategy, which is something that, you know, we're a little bit earlier stage um, uh, in our journey that is free, right, to, to a certain extent, or at least the cost is, is the team in-house and the, the, our ability to deliver great resonant, um, not tone deaf, value added content um, to, to our community. And so we think overall this notion of like brand building and um, developing a content marketing strategy that's going to be driving demand um, is worth investing in and not, not as um, risky perhaps as unlocking kind of new paid channels and, and those types of things. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about events a little bit later, but I think we, we've sort of reshifted our, our thinking around more of the experiential stuff and now are, are looking to do a lot more digitally. Um, but we think that it's so long as we can lead with a message that resonates and focus on brand building and driving more organic traffic to, to the site, um, that's really where we're putting a lot of our attention today uh, on the new business demand gen side of the house. Um, but maybe, I don't know, Heidi, do you want to, or Chandra, anyone um, want, want to uh, give their take on, on this? I'm happy to just quickly. I mean, I think the, one of the things that I just kind of encourage people on this to think about is always start with your strategy first. I think it's really easy in marketing to kind of go to the tactics like, oh, we were doing events. So now what is the next thing I'm going to do? And I think if you just take a step back and think, you know, what is my business? What are my goals that I'm trying to hit? For us, we, um, our sale is more of an enterprise sales. So I've really, I love the point about content. Um, I think we've really tried to do a few things, double down on our customers to make sure, you know, retention's good. We're not losing anything. That's like, to me, a big important point. Two, I think for us, it's a, we're trying to focus on verticals where we can engage and help verticals like maybe retail, travel, um, some of the verticals that are getting hit. How can we keep them happy? But then how can we put our energy and effort towards verticals that are actually thriving right now. So basically keeping some engaged doing well, but then focusing on other areas where um, we can have probably some more immediate success. Um, and then I think another one for people to think about, depending on the size of your company is, how can you work with your partners? So I think like for our company, we had actually a lot of very significant large events globally that we had planned, Japan, Australia, you name it. I've been spending, you know, a lot of my time getting out of contracts, trying to move things over. I mean, it's good times. So we've been doing a big virtual event. And I think, um, so that's kind of been interesting. But the point there is getting all your partners involved. So that way you're marketing into their uh, audience as, as well. And I think that that can be another like very effective strategy. So I think just, again, like always starting with what your strategy is first, because again, other companies might say, um, hey, our approach is ABM, but if your product is like $40 that you order online, that might not be the strategy. So just always think about what your goal is first before you get in all the tactics. But those are some of the things that I'd say that are working for us that we're, we're doing. Yeah, it, it's a great point. It's a good framework, Heidi. And, and so just piggybacking on that um, is, you know, if we look at it in terms of layers, right, when it comes to this content and then what's the right channels of consumption for that content, right? So if you look at it at the highest level, we're looking at these content and these three pillars of what, when I talk about agility, what, we, what should we dynamically shift? So one is content at a brand level and what we're thinking about, what are the brand messaging that makes sense today that didn't make sense about you know, six weeks ago? And two is at a sales messaging level, like you know, what is the sales team, to Heidi's point, you know, when a salesperson goes into some, somebody in logistics or in healthcare or life sciences, it's a very, very different posture than they're going into somebody in, you know, 
any of the services industries or somebody in transportation or something, this and this in the survival to thrival mode. They're in one end of the spectrum, some posts are in the middle of the spectrum, like financial services, and these other guys are like in, in scale mode, like groceries and some of the logistics companies. So be really thoughtful about how do you take that content and be dynamic about enabling the salesperson. Not a lot of content because the more you give, the less the salespeople can consume, right? Really have some tweaks to that at the sales level. And then look at content at a customer level because with deep empathy, because it's the wrong time to go to customers and say, give me a case study of how great we, <laughs> we were. And this is the wrong time to go do that. However, if you shift that posture and say from a content perspective, this is really about how you're stepping up. You know, we have just like all, every one of us, we have personas that you know, that are primary champions of ours and how they're stepping, for example, we go after the procurement persona, how they're stepping up to lead the charge in their respective organizations. If that content can inspire the rest of the community, that can be very, very valuable for us as a brand because that's with deep empathy and telling them not to talk about us, but about their leadership and stuff. So that's the way we're kind of looking at this in terms of content. Mm -hmm. And then last thing on channels is, I think to Heidi's point is, you know, it's gone from this digital world to a digital world. So we have obviously moved a lot of it to digital, but then there's two aspects of digital, right? One is going into all the sponsored advertising and stuff like that. But you know, one thing we have doubled down investing is TV for us, right? So we go after the, in brand building for the CFO persona. And, and for us, okay, where does the CFO log, you know, look at TV today? If TV things have gone up significantly is CNBC, et cetera. So we're trying to be very contextual advertising in digital, but going after the persona and really doubling down on those kind of strategies for us. So looking at content and then the right channels of consumption from a digital perspective. Super interesting. Yeah, cool. yeah I mean, I would just, um, I would echo what, um, what both of you just said. I loved the, the lead-in you gave, Heidi. Um, I have a phrase for it that, that I think somebody, maybe when I started my career at Procter & Gamble gave me, and I've just hung on to it through um, the next several years of my career. Um, which is be strategically rigid and tactically flexible. And um, I think that's just another way of saying exactly what, what you guys um, shared. And I think it, it makes sense. I mean, we know our audiences. We were clear on those before um, this COVID impact. Uh, we understood the positioning to those audiences. Um, we understood our product and the product value proposition. So if we understand the audience and we understand the product, we're really bridging. And, and as marketers, that's our role. Like we create the bridge between the audience and the products in a way that um, pays off and leads to um, relevance. So, I mean, maybe now we have different ways to do that. I think the um, things that we've found that seem to be working well is anything related to thought leadership in a space, either in an audience or a vertical or line of business, which I think really uh, mirrors what you guys were describing. So I'm not bringing a new idea to the table, but it's, it reinforces this idea of content creation, virtual events, learning, training. And I think that's, a, that's actually adding value. Um, it's not a um, self-serving action. It adds value to your audiences. If you can help them think about your products in a context that they can become smarter, they can develop better skills, um, you're gonna help them as buyers and you're gonna make them smarter through the process. So I like content, I like organic, I like virtual events, and I like the theme of thought leadership um, to the extent possible. And that could be in, literally in any industry. If you're selling um, something that's in the healthcare space, you can help people think about health, um, you can think about mental health or physical health. If there's something related to um, well-being or something related to spiritual, People need that now um, every bit as much as they need physical and, um, and mental health. If you're selling a product that goes to B2B, well, the buyers who are at home have time to digest content. And so I think you can, you can help all, all phases of the um, spectrum become smarter and more knowledgeable. So that's, that's, and that's working for us. So it's not just a, a clever little idea. Um, that's where most of our effort has been redirected to. It seems great. Really and I think, Robin, that point, you know, educational marketing, brand building via educational marketing, it's a great time. I think, I think that was your point to begin with. I think that's, it's a good tactic in these times for us to go do collectively as marketers. Agree. You, I also will, will add just a little bit for folks too. Like, I think if people are looking for, I still have a pretty, you know, sizable number I need to hit. And I know a lot of us, the, the, probably your, your overall uh, plan of record or your pipeline goals haven't necessarily changed. Just doing a lot on social, we've actually found a lot of success with that. And I think kind of going back to what everyone said, but 
you can, I, I've noticed that when you can engage socially in a way too, I mean, a lot of people are on LinkedIn right now or on Twitter because everyone has time. <laughs> and I think that um, doing it in a way that is really fun, engaging and helpful is, is definitely the way to go. Because I, I feel like more than ever, people could actually use a good laugh too. Um, it, it gets pretty intense looking at the news every day and seeing everything that's happening. And it's like, if you can help somebody out in their job, just be more efficient, help them in a way that makes them successful or, or um, hit their uh, objectives and do it in a way that brings a little bit of joy. I think that's, that's a good framework. Um, and one kind of other last thing I just wanted to highlight, we, we talked about the framework initially of where we're focusing. I think that's a really good thing to market and educate your executives on internally. Because one thing I'm imagining a lot of people here are faced with is so, sort of um, everyone coming to you, at least I, I feel like I've talked to a lot of CMOs and this is pretty much happening across the board. I have this great idea. <laughs> and I think for many of us, like, I don't know about you listening, but I don't need more ideas. <laughs> I'm like, We've got them. We just need help executing. So I think if you do have a framework and a strategy, now is a really good time to reinforce that as well too. Like, hey everyone, this is what our focus is and we're seeing the, the success and love the input, but because it's, it's not the time I think, every, everybody's a little bit at a max capacity. So that's just something that is top of mind for me that I wanted to add. <laughs> Let's, um, uh, I want the max capacity comments, great and appropriate because we have to balance as marketers now, sort of navigating the people side of this, our teams that are now all working from home, to your point, Heidi, inundated by this news um, and the news that surrounds us all and sort of the, 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 you know, the echo chamber that we're now in, um, but also having to hit our goals, having to hit our revenue goals and in these sort of agile and, and net new ways. Um, there's a question on here about uh, somebody had seen a CMO post to, that marketing should not be accountable to revenue. Uh, I don't know who would post that. I, I, I disagree um, wholeheartedly, unless anybody else has an a, a interjection there. But I do think it's important to think about how to measure marketing now, um, today. Um, in a world where, and, and perhaps this isn't something that's that's uh, the same for every one company, but you know, in some cases, um, you know, the Q2 plan or the 2020 plan has been shifted down. Um, in other cases, um, companies are maybe serving verticals that are being really successful. It's they're pedal to, to the metal, right, in terms of um, driving even, even more growth. Um, so I guess my question is, if you're advising a uh, a CMO that now they're, they're faced with like still being able to, which we all are, still being able to go and hit some, some ambitious targets, be they ambitious in a world with or without COVID. Um, how do you think about measuring ROI? How do you think about the impact of, of the, the programs that you're driving? Yeah, I'd, I'll, I'd love to take that one. Um, and I think it relates to a question that um, Helena popped up mm -hmm. in the um, chat, which is, um, First of all, a CMO is responsible for revenue. No question about it. <laughs> I want to get that one out there. Um, and in fact, a CMO really ought to be accountable for the full P&L um, because we oftentimes have the single biggest line item aside from headcount in marketing expense. So just sort of putting that one out there. Uh, that aside, I think when we think about measuring our results, like we, we really as marketers can't just measure the final outcome. Like we really, it's not sufficient to just measure orders or revenue or depending on your business model, subscription or ARR. I feel like as marketers, we're accountable for the customer experience. So when you think about from customer audience slash target to product, there are a number of steps that the customer follows, which we all either call the customer journey or end to end experience or buying cycle. And I think as marketers, we have accountability for every step in that process. And so that means we're understanding from the TAM, which is the total addressable market, to the levels of awareness of our product or our category, aided and unaided, down to some level of engagement or intent, um, down to some sort of touch point, some like superficial engagement, either web traffic or some other similar intermediate metric to maybe uh, an engagement metric like a trial or 
a lead or a, some kind of contact through the brining process, which is sort of how leads flow through MQL to SQL to oftentimes people call SQOs to a closed sale. And then actually, I think marketers own the customer experience as well. Like, did the product get deployed? Did the product get used? Are customers happy with the product? Are they finding new uses for it? And are they loyal to the product such that they're going to re-engage and, and repurchase? And so I think as marketers, we have to stitch together our entire customer experience, the whole customer journey in, in big steps. And we need measures at every step in the funnel. And I don't mean just the digital funnel. I don't mean just traffic, page conversion, checkout conversion, um, average order value. I mean like the full funnel. And that's not easy to do. So sometimes you have to have proxy metrics to, to get a handle on it. And I think the reason I highlight that now and why I anchor back to that just in general is that if we're having a hard time converting customers because they're apprehensive, because they're stalling any kind of like commitment, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't still be trying to raise awareness of the product, trying to create some level of engagement, trying to seed some early indication of interest, and at the same time taking the customers that we currently have in the pipeline and continuing to nurture and engage them. And I think if we think that the only thing we're doing is from MQL to close, we've kind of missed, as marketers, we've missed the main point. But there's up funnel and down funnel marketing that has to be done to um, continue to grow the business. So that's my, that's my take. Pretty emphatic about that one. I'm holding myself accountable to that um, as well as our team. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll just add to, I mean, that was a, a great overview. I'll, I completely agree. I think the question around do marketers own revenue, I, I feel like that was clickbait. <laughs> I, I'm like, no one could really ask that question. Um, I think I saw that on LinkedIn too. And I, I was like, I don't even have enough time to write to that right now because it, it's, it's fundamentally like so wrong. Um, I think I agree. I mean, I, I always say our job as a marketer is really to help grow the business and that's, you know, acquisition, uh, retention and ultimately expansion. And I think on the metric side, um, I think the piece that I like to consider um, is really what is the question that you're asking and then make sure that, that you have the metric to address that. And so I think Rob highlighted that there's different questions that you'll ask throughout that entire uh, journey and cycle. And I think to me, there's sort of the team metrics that you look at like early on, how are we doing for awareness, engagement? Um, are we getting meetings and target accounts? Um, you know, are SDR successful? Are they able to do what they need to do? Um, what is the deal cycle like? Are we seeing the velocity? Uh, is that looking good? Um, I think all those things are really, really important to take a look at. But then I think as you move up and are talking to more executives, you can do something as simple as this is what my marketing investment is. And this is the return on that investment. And you can basically have programs and people and then um, just programs. And that, that's something that I've noticed a lot of board members like to see because it's like, hey, this is what you're giving me for the year. This is what I've been able to return for that. And I agree with Rob that it's you know ultimately complete revenue. Um, but I think most of us definitely look at pipeline and, and measure it that way, so. Right, I mean, if, if I add my two cents, I think these guys are completely spot on. I mean, we call our team revenue marketing. There's a reason we call our team revenue marketing because why do marketing for any other sake? Ultimately, it's about driving revenue. So we kind of philosophically want to get that to the rest of the organization that marketing exists for that purpose. So having said that, how do you measure marketing across the revenue cycle to the point Rob made, which is about life cycle? Uh, I think if you look at it, all of us are looking at it now as a flywheel rather than a funnel. So if you look at awareness, acquisition, and advocacy as that flywheel, I think the three simple metrics that we use, and we talk about in the good times, and then we talk about what the shift is now, is to Heidi's point also, one is you know how much of sales accepted pipeline have you generated, or, 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 or core-driven, all pipeline, meaning not just source, but core-driven with, with, across the different mixes. Two is the win rate. It, you know, because ultimately, how do you measure effectiveness of bottom of the funnel product marketing, right? And it is about if sales is winning more, winning bigger, that means all your messaging, positioning, pricing is working because no salesperson is going to come and say, I won because my messaging was great or I won because my pricing was great. They're going to say, it's me, me, and me. So how do you measure that? It is about that win rate and ASP on, 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 the, on, the, on the acceleration piece. And then the flywheel effect, we look at number of advocates created, which is, you know, are we creating enough advocates and showcasing those stories? Because if you, if in this world, you know, to the life cycle point Rob made, 
if you get more customers, if you keep them longer and they shout from the rooftop and, and influence new prospects, that's a true effectiveness of how lifecycle marketing is working, right? Now, that's all in good times. In today's times, the one balancing the boat thing we would do is give more focus on measurement going after the install base. Because ultimately, we're all about the fastest path to the most dollars. And how can marketing help sales find the fastest path to the most dollars? In that context, for us, going and getting an extra dollar from a customer is, is a little bit easier in today's times than going and get an extra dollar from a prospect because of the situation that's going on. So have a little bit more programmatic approach to going after the install base in these times and, and thoughtfully do that in such a way that you can go drive your cross-sell marketing and your upsell marketing uh, with more emphasis in today's time to be that, that I talked about agility in the shift. That would be something that uh, if you do have a big install base and you have some good products that you can go cross-sell upsell, I would say that this is the time to have that increased emphasis on that. Totally. Totally. Chandra, you, you mentioned messaging a little bit. So I wanted to um, touch on that because I think a lot of the questions were um, sourcing here around pipeline and, and these types of things, which are, are good. Um, but how are we, how are you all thinking about shifting your positioning or your messaging during this time? Um, you know, I think the word, I mentioned this last call, cheesy, but uh, if you did a word cloud of every one of these co conversations, the word empathy has probably come up more than, than any other word um, in, in this topic. And so I'm just curious, it, it, how have you thought about taking the positioning that has worked in the best of times and now have sort of reimagined them or, or, or have you in the best in, in the times that we're in? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, you know, first of all, you know, we have the, I talked about agility, right? So from the highest messaging arc at the highest level, Heidi's point, start with the strategy and start with the highest level messaging arc. You know, we have focused on this, empathy is, is, is one word, but the word we have focused on in trying to build our message, new messaging arc is about resilience in our business, right? And how do you build resilience in times of uncertainty? And how can we be an enabler of resilience for these organizations at these different, you know, at these different industries, et cetera. So that's the word. And we pivoted on that word and created a whole set of, you know, brand level arcs and sales messaging, you know, even we're launching a customer podcast series about how they're building resilience in, in there. So kind of at the three levels, at the brand level, at the sales level, at the customer level, and aligning to that messaging in all the fronts. Uh, and, and speaking of that, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit, you know, messaging is always a continuously improving exercise and see if this is taking to the market because we've done some early concept testing and seeing if resilience is the right word and we seem to get some good resonation from, resonance from our prospects and customers, in, uh, the buyers in our community. So that's how we have pivoted. Now, interestingly, if you take your positioning and if you look at the Maslow's hierarchy for a CFO today, using a, a metaphor here, you know, what stays on top for the CFO? Because all decisions today in technology buying is going out and the CFO is now in the finance is taking control of that in these times, right? If you're associated with cost control and risk, that gets the CFO's attention right now. Then below that in the Maslow's hierarchy is if you're getting to with growth, interesting. But if you're talking about productivity, efficiency, all that good stuff, they're going to be like, you know, the CFO becomes the chief FU officer. <laughs> you know, they're not going to necessarily engage with you. Um, so it's really understanding even if your product is not directly associated with, like, for example, if you have a product like HR that's driving efficiency and employee productivity, you got to figure out in your positioning in these current times, how do you elevate the message in the hierarchy to talk about cost or risk, cost in this particular case, or risk. If you can do that, in fact, I was talking to a CEO from a company that's, that's help desk support software, right? In good times, the messaging would be about excellence and growth and all this stuff. But in bad times today, you should probably go resonate towards the, the higher level, the cost message, because that's what the CFO is looking at, because a dollar saved is more than a dollar earned in, in, today's, in today's world. So that's why I would say that's the one is the arc and two is, are we resonating with the ultimate economic buyer and what they care about in these times? And having that shift towards that would be my answer. To that. And cool. How do you rob anything to, to add? I would I, just That was well put. put. It was well put. I would just say, I think for a lot of people, um, one of the things that kind of when all of this hit, especially for those of you that have global teams, like, I think you kind of think, how do I make these changes and do it fast across like all of these different regions? Um, 
And one of the things that I'll just put out there that can be helpful is if you work with your SDR team on some different uh, message tests and you can see where, um, whether they use an outreach or a sales loft or a tool like that. This is just kind of a hacky way to do it. And you can start to see where you're seeing um, some pickup, where they're able to have better conversations. That is one way if, if you're in the process of doing this right now, because um, sometimes just kind of making some of those shifts is, uh, it's not always easy to do it as fast as we'd all like. So um, I think it's good to do it that way. And then you have the data behind it as well too, to actually see it's not just our team's opinion, but what's actually sticking. I just add that. It's a great point. The one, if I just add one more point for all of us, um, you know, something I learned from, there's a great piece from Jeffrey Moore, who actually wrote about this in 2009, when was the last economic downturn happened about this concept of shifting from solution selling to provocation selling. And it's an HBR, it's for all of us. And I think it's worth the read for all of us today. And it's something we are experimenting with too. And the genesis of the, the simple part of the idea there is in good times, we do solution selling as sellers. We listen to what the customer's existing pain is. And we say our product is best positioned to solve this pain. And his thesis here is that in bad times, you shifted to more provocation selling, of course, with deep empathy and say that, hey, this is the kind of pain you provoke the customer saying, this is the kind of pain you're going to have and in these bad times and how I can be essential to solve the problem, right? Of course, not every company can have that posture, but if you're able to have that posture and do it with deep empathy, it's worth experimenting. It's, it's a really good piece and I would encourage all of us. I learned a lot from it, something to experiment with. Shuja and I sent it at the same exact time to the chat. So um, definitely take a look at that when, when folks have a chance. Cool. Um, why don't we go back to, uh, to Slido here? There's a question. Um, you know, uh, how you started, started on this path of, of SDRs. And in general, it feels like there's an even, even stronger opportunity for us to align as marketers with our sales team, um, be it SDRs, depending on where they live in, in the organization, uh, obviously closers, even the, the customer success organization or post sales, which Rob's alluding to around our sort of ownership and influence on, on the entire customer experience. So I'm curious, uh, uh, in a world that, that we're currently living in, um, I hate to use the term uh, wartime, you know, peacetime, but I mean, we're in this mode where, where things are just a little bit different. Um, how do you think about the relationship between sales and marketing? We had to be tight all along. In the best of times, we had to be close. What does it mean for us now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, it just starts, and this is something that I've really tried to put in place since being at Telium. It, it, it's, for me, it really starts with a mindset. Yeah. I really am a big believer in a revenue team, a revenue organization, and also revenue ops. I actually never really make the distinction between sales. I mean, we're all in sales. Like, and if you think you're not, <laughs> you're, you're probably not in the right job. So I always think, you know, I'm going into it. Like it, I think of marketing has a particular responsibility, but like SDRs and sales there, it, it's like, I'm the body and they're the arm. Like it's just an extension and we're all kind of the same body. Um, and so I think I've always just had that mindset. So I think more now than ever, it's, probably just a lot more communication with them and getting a sense of what is working. Because as I mentioned earlier, we have a set of verticals where, um, I'll just give an example, like travel and hospitality. Um, it's, it's rough for them right now. People are not traveling clearly. So how can we be helpful, engage them, give them content that um, could possibly help them transition to more of a digital uh, presence. But then for other verticals, like we're actively going after them and seeing what works. So I need to be meeting with sales and SDRs probably more frequently. So that's kind of what I would say is just doing a lot more rapid testing and getting some of those results back so we can quickly see what's working versus not. And I just think um, your sales and SDR team, I mean, what an incredible place to get feedback mm -hmm. because they, they'll tell you. And um, I just, yeah, that, that's kind of what I'd say. But to me, it's just that mentality of like a revenue org versus silos just I, I just don't think yeah. that's the future I think that's that I would agree with that I think that's um, what we're trying to do as well what I maybe what I would do is um, your, your points Heidi were exactly how I would think about it I would just maybe change I would reword it just a little bit not because um, I disagree with it but just more for audience consumption I think up a level the point really for all of us is that um, as marketers, we rely on customer feedback to tune messaging, to tune positioning, to gauge what's working. 
And at a time when our audiences are changing quickly, where their perspective about whether they're going to buy or not buy, whether they're going to delay or move quicker, um, what they're prioritizing in terms of um, how they want to digest our product, like when that's changing as quickly as it is, we can't field research. We can't wait to read um, the performance of search or the performance of display or to plan a virtual event, execute a virtual event, and then gather the survey data post event. Like that's way, way too slow. And so the, the best real time data is actually people talking to customers on the phone every day. And so, you know, for all of us, that includes customer support, customer success, which is, you know, more engagement or solution consulting and then any of our XDR resources. So anybody who's in the pre-sale motion, anyone who's in the implementation motion, and anyone in the, who's in the help motion, we have to have a way to gather that data. And so what I think is important right now is quickly finding a way to digest that, build some simple process, whether it's with a Google Doc or whatever, to ingest it, categorize it, understand it, and then act on it. And so that, um, which I think is exactly what you're saying, Heidi. So all I was doing is trying to share more tactically how um how we're doing that yeah it, it's a great point rob and, and if i just you know just practically just to piggyback on all of this and going back to the the, the genesis of the question sales and marketing going back to the point heidi made on, on mindset uh, it, it really is you know the mindset is just to remind if, if, the, if the head of sales ran the entire organization just optically right which is sales and marketing there's a different perspective right which is because every dollar you spend in marketing is only for one purpose to make sales successful Right. If you kind of always remind them, it's not a dollar you're spending for yourself. It's a dollar's enabling organization you're spending. That it's people dollar or program dollar is to ultimately make sales successful. So that's kind of the, the alignment mindset that we are. I always say, listen, I need more investment only because the dollar is going to be for your success, right? And so having that kind of alignment is a good start, both even also at the, at the executive level, and just tactically, just double clicking on you know Rob's point. Just another perspective. Something we have done is. The worst thing we can do is as marketing right now is to throw some stuff over the wall to sales because we are not in the trenches to seeing what's not working and, and stuff like that. So one practical thing we, have, we are trying to do in three of our segments with enterprise segment, mid market segment, or even our install base segment is really have a small tiger team of, you know, a segment marketer, a, mar a demand gen marketer, an ADR leader, and a sales leader together and doing that on a weekly basis saying, okay, let's recalibrate, let's run these plays and dynamically shift. Okay, what's working, what's not? Because you're getting that input from the sales leaders and both at the ABP level and the RVP level and having the three to five person tiger team to really come and come back and say, how do we dynamically recalibrate and change? That might be a good thing if we can, uh, you know, have these small, small teams in this time to get the input from the field and, and bring it back to retweak into the marketing organization. Love that. Great. Well, let's talk about the people a little bit. Um, obviously, this is now, I guess, depending on where you live in, in the world, you know, five, six, eight, seven, eight weeks into the, the work from home scenario that, that we're all living in. Um, how have you found that at just maybe more into the leadership side of, of the role? How have you led your teams through this in the sense of you know, obviously there, like I mentioned earlier, the, the externalities that surround us um, and the news and everything, but also the reality that, um, you know, Heidi, you're, you're home with, uh, you know, your girls and, you know, schools are canceled. There's obviously so many constraints that we're all trying to rally around in order to still be productive. And I found personally with, with Front, we've got a lot of new people join the team. I'm relatively new to the company. Like what I want to do more than anything else is get to an offsite with the team and get together and team build and kind of really invest in each other. We obviously can't do that today. Um, so any tips or tricks or just philosophy on how you've kept the team connected, motivated, um, you know, uh, excited about the agility required to be successful in this next chapter? Heidi, go for it. Sure. I, I think there's there's two things that I've seen that have been pretty effective. Um, one, I'll just put out there because I'm sure all of us are, you know, having our standing team meetings and, you know, doing that normal stuff. But um, I think for me, I had a fairly big events team. 
And I think here you have these talented, great people that do events and we know we're not doing events. So I, I thought, you know, what a chance and opportunity for people to start to learn some new skills and actually really get them excited on some new projects. So one of the folks I, I said, you know, look, you're gonna be in charge of this virtual event. Somebody else, I'm like, you're gonna learn webinars. The other person, I'm like, get used to Marketo. <laughs> we, we need some help there. So I think it's it's been actually a pretty cool opportunity because people have learned new skills. They're kind of excited to work with other members of the team. And just that change has brought on some new excitement. And not to mention, like, I'm, I, I mean, I think many of us here would love to probably hire 10, 20 more people. It's not always possible in the moment. So I'm really trying to make sure that all the folks on my team, I, I'm leveraging to the best of my ability. That's one. And then we also on Tuesdays and Thursdays just have a Zoom lunch. I know that could sound weird, <laughs> but we all just eat lunch together at our desks. And um, I, I typically uh, try to tell some jokes that sometimes are good, sometimes aren't, but we do our <laughs> best to keep it fun. That's, it's great. It's great. And I think this, this you know, I'll just piggyback on what Heidi said is, is, is a few things. I think, you know, one thing we have noticed here is productivity has actually gone up and not gone down. Like, you know, at least people are working so much harder. They've lost, you know, this two hour commutes don't happen. And so they're, you know, stuck in one place, There's a lot of focus, but people are working harder in this time frame. At least I can speak for you know, many of the teams here that that's happening. So some of the practical things is, you know, stay connected. The Zoom launches, the Zoom happy hours are, are great. Um, there's a couple of things is one is to Heidi's point, there's learning and there's one learning is about learning a function that is, you know, between like event marketing, learning DG and stuff. So another time is, you know, one thing we have put is 40 hours of mandatory learning that they can do, go to Coursera, take a, take a course in marketing or do something. And this is a great time to go spend that one extra hour in commuting and can, can go do that. And it's kind of an informal mandate. We have said, go spend, you know, four hours in the next four weeks learning something and taking a course or something like that. So that's, 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 that's you know, exper experimenting with that and how effective it can be. Um, and then, you know, you know, another thing is, you know, have some theme of the week. We've done spirit weeks, this, this day is spirit week and today was the, you know, Hawaii day as so I just got, got out of that. So having that kind of some sort of group thing and, and Slack has been a great channel for that. Um, did you get the, the, the vibrance going every day? Uh, you know, today is bring your kids to lunch. So we're going to bring all our kids to lunch today. So having that kind of, you know, connection in a virtual way is, is, has been, uh, uh, you know, it, it, getting that vibrance going and effective for this. The last thing I would say is we are so connected is one of the things I have tried to do is have a disconnect day, which is, you know, people are working so hard is say, hey, listen, take a day off, disconnect, you know, disconnect from all these, you know, Zooms and all these things. And maybe we'll catch up on Tiger King and all the shows you haven't watched. But really, uh, you know, um, we get your energy back because I do feel people are working harder now in these times than they've done before. We're done disconnect day as well. Like that, that, I want to experiment with that myself. Um, cool. Rob, anything you want to add? I mean, those are all the, the, the I think we're, we must be reading from the same book. Um, those are all the things that we're all um, doing. Um, yeah, I can't think of, of any, like, any tactic that we've employed that, that may be different than that. I think you guys mentioned this, but I'll highlight it, which is I feel like over-communicating um, to the entire org right now is really important. I think there's, there's sort of a feeling of um, disconnectedness in, the, in where the company is going, even if the company hasn't changed its strategies. There is just, as I'm on calls, I, I hear a lot of questions that um, lead us all to believe that either SDRs or salespeople or the customer success reps wonder about things that I think maybe we as leaders take for granted, but that nothing has changed. Like we're still helping customers. We're still focused on trying to drive the business. Um, we still care about our employees. And so maybe like, like that, um, lack of communication creates a bit of anxiety and a void for employees. And so what I've tried to do is just be really overt with more messaging, more emails, more group discussions where I just kind of reinforce the basics um, for no other reason than just to try to help teams feel comfortable that we're still on the same path. We're still trying to do the same things that we were trying to do back in January. Um, and so I, I think that's helpful, but I, I don't think it's necessarily independent of um, what Chandar or Heidi shared. 
No, it's one point you just made, Rob. It's a very good one, which is, is I think there's employee there's, there's employee advocacy within marketing, but today marketing has a very critical role to have employee advocacy across the company. So when the CEO is communicating to the company and a global company, and for us, you know, we have you know people in forty different countries, you know, what is that message? What is that message of ins inspirational message, and how can you know the connected message and stuff? So for those of us who run employee advocacy within marketing, there's a great time for us to kind of shape that message and be co-partners with the chief people officer as well as uh, the CEO to bring that connectedness in a global environment through employee advocacy. Totally. Um, I want to add one last idea to the table that we're starting this week. We'll let you know how it goes uh, next Thursday. But um, we were inspired by um, many of you have probably seen John Krasinski from The Office do some good news. Um, it's a just a campaign that, that they're running or whatever. Um, but he's highlighting just some good news that the news might miss um, just to bring in some positivity into the day. So we started a Slack channel called Some Good News where we're sharing just like wins that are happening um, uh, across the business. So we were down selected at, at a vendor, you know, that, that's a high, pro, high profile logo. Um, you know, we had success with this one campaign. We had a customer turnaround. Um, and we thought just injecting some of that positivity into the day, into people's Slack feeds, um, was just a great way to create those little moments of, of joy kind of throughout the day. Um, so we'll, we'll let you know how that goes, but so far so good on, on, uh, hashtag some good news. Um, Awesome. So, sorry, my, my video cut out there for a second. So we've got nine minutes. So probably time for one last question um, to go around. Um, and so this one came in from Nish. Um, so I'll quickly share my screen here. Um, how are you thinking of what the new normal may look like? And, and I'm interpreting that to be coming out of this, um, whenever that day comes. Uh, I, I believe work um, is not going to be the same. Uh, things are going to be much different, be it in how we uh, experience work in, you know, different offices or, you know, how we think about our hiring strategies, um, how we think about our messaging. Um, how do you think the world's going to look from and, and what's our, uh, our role in sort of helping shape that and re react to that um, in a world after COVID? You're sharing a screen, you know that, right? Oh, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Your email. <laughs> Just as an FYI. It was all positive, uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, there it is. So <laughs> how are you thinking of, uh, of what the new normal may look like uh, coming out? Boy, if anybody knows the answer to this one, <laughs> you are you're yeah, a soothsayer. It's a, little, it's a little bit of predicting the future I, I, I appreciate. Um, one thing I'll, I'll just add, you know, I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I've lived in the Bay Area for a decade. Uh, somehow convinced my CEO of Gainsight two years ago to let me uh, uh, move here. Um, we have a small office here. Um, and at front, you know, having multiple sites or remote employees is kind of a new thing. And, you know, we're now introducing, uh, you know, our, our small but growing office here is about 10 people now over the last six months. Um, and we plan to continue to grow it. But I think, you know, we're in this new mode now where, from a hiring perspective, um, we're forced to adapt to this work from home model. And so the idea of finding great talent wherever they are is probably something I think every company is going to have to face or, or adopt kind of coming out of um, uh, coming out on the other side of, the, of this. Um, I think Aaron Levy's actually been really interesting with his tweeting around digital transformation, like hat yeah. went from like, you know, Hey, I will do that, you know, in 2021 or what have you to now we're all forced to do it now. Uh, and so that's just one thing that I thought about from the hiring perspective, that the world may not quite look the same. Some of the cultural norms around, um, you know, teammate kind of culture and, and office kind of culture is going to be shifting. Um, is something that I think might come out of this. Agreed. I, I think one of the things that I think will come out of it is, is you know, many of us, uh, I think a big part of our mix are, you know, events, whether that's a field event, you know, um, a CMO dinner, but here we are doing this and, you know, in a way instead. Um, and I think it, it's really going to push people to be a little bit more um, very thoughtful around their communication style. Because I think it's easy to go to an event and you can, in a lot of cases, I see many people just kind of wing it and they still can get a pretty good outcome because it's in person. There's a lot that goes into that as far as, you know, you spend time with somebody, they like you, great, the deal happens. 
And I think, you know, sales will not be able to depend on that. Marketing is not going to be able to depend on that in the same way. So it's going to really force our rigor on some other channels that, you know, to be fair, not everyone may not be at an A+. <laughs> so I think, I think it's just going to have to, a lot of folks are going to really have to think about, okay, I can't depend on that feel good dinner with all the wine to get the deal across the board. How, I mean, let's be real, right? Um, how are we going to do that instead in a way that we can scale and is, and is systematic? So I think that's going to be a change. Um, and I think that it is also, it may be a really good thing coming out of this. I still think, and I wonder what others on this um, also feel, but you still look at LinkedIn and Twitter and a lot of it is like, oh God, I like, seriously heard that a million times. And it, it's, it feels very like, I, I don't know. It's just like everything seems like you've heard it before. And I think it will push us as, as a function to be a lot more real, actually, because I think that's what people respond to. And um, I think that's a good thing. So. Yeah, I, you're, you're, you're spot on on that. I'll just piggyback on it. I think we will operate when I mean, we want to operate on the assumption that the world's not going to change in 2020, that this is the new normal in 2020. So if you take that mindset and say, OK, how I'm going to execute marketing for the rest of 2020, I think this concept of one to many is just gone for 2020. Right? It's going to be replaced by one to few. So even for our conference, for example, some folks have run virtual conferences and, you know, I, I would uh, here's our question is is like okay what's the effectiveness of a virtual conference because really when you have even a physical conference to Heidi's point it's when you come in you engage in that one to few environment in that physical conference too when you're meeting prospects and customers in a close environment that's really what is moving the deal forward and having that right prospects meet the right customers the right sellers as I like to say which are customers meeting our prospects so I, I think doing mass one to many virtual I personally say how effective would that be versus having this one to few and it's a chance for us to be very creative as an as an as as a function how do we create this one to few experiences in a virtual way between prospects and customers in in with more creativity than we have and i think this will be a unique opportunity to go explore that um, as marketers uh, at least on the b2b side right there's some great stuff that's happening on the b2c side but something we can learn from but the operating premise is the new normal in 2020 is there is no going to be one too many. It's, that's, that's the way I'm operating and, and assuming as we go forward. You're muted, Anthony. Thank you. Man, I'm dropping the ball today. Uh, well, right. Keep anything you want to keep it exactly, exactly. Um, anything you want to add to close us out or? No, I, I mean, I wish I wish I knew what yeah. it was going to look like. I think um, maybe if anything, I'll share this that the way I personally am thinking about it is that the need to be really aware of customer trends and market trends is heightened because similar to the point that I made before about accessing customer feedback from any source, things are going to change. Like I think we could assume some things about what June, July and August will look like. They'll look different than what we think. We can assume some things about what next year will look like. They'll be different than what we think. Mm -hmm. So if anything, we as marketers should um, force ourselves to think more about our target customers, learn more about them, be more sensitive to their needs and how they want to be spoken to, how they want to be engaged. So that customer centricity will, will continue to be critically important. That's one. Um, and maybe two, um, that this, this notion of... Um, we talked about it as B2B versus B2C. And one of the things that I think B2C brands do really well is they market simply. They tell the story of the product and the product benefits really clearly. They don't mince words. They don't dance around topics. If they have a product that helps you clean something better, they tell you. It's like, buy this because you will have a cleaner whatever. Or buy this because it soaks up stains faster. And I think as B2B marketers, we dance around topics um, with a bit of finesse and a bit of trickery because we feel like we have to. Um, and I think we should endeavor to be more clear and more crisp, which I think is the benefit of one-to-one -one conversation is you're talking directly to a potential customer. So you can't mince words. You, you have to say what are the features and benefits of your product very clearly. And maybe that to the point that Chandar shared is a halo. Like, let's as B2B marketers 
be more crisp about why someone should use our product and what our product does and why it would benefit them or their organization. So customer centricity and product clarity, maybe those are the, the themes I would pull out. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Heidi, Rob, Chandar, thank you, everyone who's been on the call. Um, this was great. And, and I think just in general, the, I'm, I'm inspired every time we do one of these. And you know, there's so much um, goodness happening. And I think communities like this uh, help both reinforce that and pay it, pay it forward. So thanks, everyone, for, for making the time. And have a great rest of your day. Great job moderating it, Anthony. Great yeah. job. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Take care.